Hi everyone and welcome to part two of this series, What is the Infinite, entitled The Illusion of Separation. Even though the infinite comprises the totality of all there is, it would be wrong to think of it as a mere collection of discrete physical objects. It's a unity rather than a multiplicity. The infinite is a seamless continuum of which all things are part. The boundaries that we subconsciously project onto it are not really there. Separation is ultimately an illusion. Everything merges into each other to form an uninterrupted process which has no beginning or end. At what point exactly does a human being come into existence, for example? At the moment when the male sperm penetrates the female egg? When the conceptus is formed? A month after conception? The moment of birth? No matter where we decide to draw the line, it will always be an arbitrary decision on our parts. It will always be a construct of consciousness that we mentally project onto proceedings. In reality, there is only a continuum. The human never really comes into existence at all except as an illusion. Nothing in the universe has a beginning or an end. The causal processes that comprise a particular object cannot be separated in any way from the causal processes that comprise the rest of the universe. It's our conceptualizing minds which arbitrarily carve up this continuum into things. It's we who decide where one thing ends and another begins. The way the mind delineates reality into things can be compared to the way we delineate the Earth's surface into lines of latitude and longitude. While these lines are obviously very useful for the purposes of navigation and measuring time and so forth, no one would dispute that they are mental creations and nothing else. It's simply our way of carving up the Earth for practical purposes. The same applies to the existence of things themselves. We find it useful to carve up reality into things and treat these carvings as though they were real, independent objects. As long as we never forget that the realness and independence of these carvings is an illusion of our own creation, there will never be a problem with our doing this. But alas, people do forget, and wars break out. Now the fact that all boundaries are illusory does not mean that reality is merely a featureless, homogenous soup in which there is no differentiation at all. Instead, think of reality as a kind of flowing stream in which eddies and bubbles and all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes are constantly being created. Whilst these eddies and bubbles certainly exist to our senses and seem to possess boundaries, it's easy enough to see that if we were to alter our perspective sufficiently, their boundaries would magically disappear and we would observe their lack of separation from the rest of the stream. Similarly, even though reality is constantly differentiating itself into distinct forms, its sheer lack of boundaries dictates that these forms ultimately have no beginning or end, and ultimately no real or inherent existence. At any given moment, our senses and minds experience a rich tapestry of colours, sounds, smells, feelings, emotions and thoughts. It's a complex tapestry composed of countless details, full of variety, ever-changing and yet always complete. It's like a fantastic work of art, far greater than any masterpiece created by man. The details are almost mesmerising. No matter where one looks or how minutely one examines a single aspect of this tapestry, the view is always intricate and rich. Anyone with a developed aesthetic sense could never tire of gazing at its beauty. But note that what we experience directly in any given moment cannot be disputed. For example, if we perceive what seems like a tree in a particular moment, then it becomes an indisputable fact that what we see in that moment is something which seems like a tree. It's impossible for this to be refuted in any way. Even the mere attempt to refute it would involve a tacit admission that one actually did perceive it. Of course, the additional question of whether the object concerned really is a tree and not an hallucination of some kind is open to debate. But that's a question which only arises after the initial perception. The existence of the initial perception itself is beyond dispute. Likewise, the perception of contrast between different objects also cannot be disputed. For example, the visible contrast between what seems like a tree and what seems like empty space surrounding the tree. This direct perception of contrasts is beyond the possibility of being an hallucination. It is real. And yet at the same time, these contrasts are never anything more than an appearance to us as an observer. The perspective that we create as observers is what allows these contrasts to come into being in the first place. They have no other reality outside of this. A white cloud can seem sharply divided from the blue sky from our perspective here on the ground, yet if we zoom up into the cloud and try to establish where the boundary between the cloud and sky actually lies, we wouldn't be able to do so. The seemingly sharp boundary would give way to a fuzzy continuum in which the cloud gradually thins out. 
even the densest pieces of matter lack clear-cut edges when viewed from the molecular or subatomic perspective. This illustrates the more general truth that the boundaries and contrasts we perceive directly in the world are appearances only. They are entities which only exist to an observer with a particular kind of perspective. Outside of this perspective, they have no existence at all. The contrasts that we perceive directly in the world obviously play a very large role in determining how we should mentally carve up the world into things. So when I said earlier that the carving up process was an arbitrary one, I was using the term arbitrary somewhat loosely. Even though the way we mentally carve up the world is arbitrary in the sense that we could easily choose to carve it up in a different manner if we wanted to, it's undeniable that there are ways of carving which seem more natural and practical than others. For example, it's usually more natural for us to draw boundaries around a tree at the interface of its bark and the surrounding space, rather than, say, at a line 10 metres further out into space. It's more natural because the tree presents a natural outline due to the contrast between its dense molecular structure and the relative emptiness of the surrounding space. We generally find it more useful to think of the tree as consisting solely of the dense molecular part, as opposed to, say, the dense molecular part plus 10 metres of surrounding space. There are many instances, though, where this is not the case. Consider, for example, the boundaries of Australia. Although there appears to be a natural outline of Australia in the interface of its coasts and the adjoining seas, it's politically more useful to extend its boundaries further out to sea, thus enabling the Australian government to patrol its coastlines and protect its interests more effectively. The strip of ocean between the coastline and this projected boundary is officially regarded as being part of Australia. Importantly, the widening of Australia in this manner is no more contrived or artificial than that of confining it to its coastlines. Whether one chooses to lay the boundaries at the coastlines or further out to sea, the process is exactly the same. In both cases, a mental boundary is cutting up what is essentially a causal continuum. In the end, how we choose to cover up the world is not so much an arbitrary process on our parts, but one that is specifically determined by our goals and values. It's our desires and values which determine what goals we have and, in turn, what kind of world we ultimately perceive. Hence the profound comment by the Buddha that the world is created by desire. In part three, categories.